Good morning. It's Sunday morning. It's the Lord's Day. This is the best day of the week, isn't it not? I'm sure excited to be with you this morning. I'm good to be excited to be anywhere this morning. Whether we're at home or at church, whether wherever, it's good to be in the house of God this, this morning. At least I'm here and it's not Sunday morning. I'm pre-recording this for the sake of the class. This is the Fresh Start Sunday School class, Parker Memorial Baptist Church in Lansing, Michigan. For those that are watching worldwide, hello world. I heard a funny story about this preacher way down in West Virginia. They let him get on the radio and he thought for sure that radio station went around the world and he got on there and, his, and he, he's so excited. He goes, hello world. And it reached out about five miles out of town. That's about all it was. <laughs> so hello world, this is world. This is, uh, anybody can watch this anywhere in the world. And so we've been studying different lessons. And uh, this last week we started lesson 11. And this lesson is about money and possessions in general. So if you don't have any money or possessions in general, you won't, this won't bother you at all, Okay. <laughs> Uh, we do have some possessions. Every one of us owns a little bit of something. And, um, and some of us have a little bit of money. Maybe it might be $10 or $20. And some of it may be more than that, of course. But uh, it, what this is trying to do, this lesson is trying to give us perspective of our possessions are precious. And our possessions are given to us by God. He said, well, I make all my money and I put it in the bank and I do this. And I'm sure you did it, but God gave you the health and the mind and the ability to make it. You realize all that could be gone tomorrow, a stroke, a cerebral hemorrhage, something physical. That as we, we will read a verse about a young, rich, young ruler. We do read, I don't know if we'll read it this week, but last week. He said, I'm going to go build barns and bigger barns, and i got to store all my goods. And, uh, and the Lord said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required at thee. So we don't know tomorrow. And so we have a little lesson plan here. I'm sure you don't have one. If you needed one, we could. If you want to take notes, you're surely welcome to. But we got through questions one through four last week. And uh, we started with the text verse in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 10 where it says, The love for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, that they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. He said, All oh, money will make me happy. Well, if you have the right perspective about your money and your possessions, you can be a very happy person when you keep it in perspective. But I've seen a lot of people ruined because of money. And it breaks my heart, it really does, because the perspective is, it was all about them and how they got it and how they, you know, use it and what they buy with it. There's nothing, there's nothing spiritual about it. But if we could just look at everything that we own as God, you've blessed me with this, and the money you bless me with, I want to be a blessing back to you and other people too. And yes, take care of your needs. I'm, I'm not, you got to take care of your family and your home and yourself and so forth. I'm not begrudging anybody of that. But our first question, to quickly give you a review, does the amount of wealth you have determined whether or not God is pleased with you? Did you catch it? Does the amount of wealth that you have, does that determine how much God is pleased with you? The answer is no. Little or, little or much, God is pleased with all of us if our attitude is right. And have a heart, a right heart attitude. The love of money. Not, now, the Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money. Oh, I just got to have it, just got to have it. And so what can we learn about man and money from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10? That the love of money is the root of all evil. And it could cause a lot of grief. And it can cause you to err from the faith. 
Because a lot of times money will even pull people out of church. I heard I've heard story after story where people started making money. Uh, Brother Nichols was just here told about a man that started making a lot of money and started missing church. And he goes, oh, I'm all right, preacher. And his home's all blown up and everything because he just thought money was it and he lost everything that he had. It's so sad when people go that far. What was Job's attitude concerning wealth is the next thought. He said this, after he lost hundreds and thousands of dollars in his cattle, he lost his children, he lost his servants, he lost buildings. He said, the Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so that was a good attitude. I realized Job had some bitterness later on. I know it, whether it was toward God or toward his friends that weren't too friendly, I don't really know. But uh, we do know that at the end, God did bless Job because he got right. And a lot of times people get wrong. They can be right. If you get out of perspective with your, with your possessions, you can be right. get right about that. And then quickly, number four, and this is where we, I'll just give you, I, I, I don't have time to go through all of these, but I'll give you, it says list five wrong attitudes towards money that will interfere with your relationship with God and give a scripture, scripture reference that helps best understand each wrong attitude. I'm just going to give you uh, the, the answer and then the reference. You can look them up if, you, if you're taking notes. But a wrong attitude would be if you trust your possessions or your money rather than trusting God. And that's from Mark chapter 10, and that's the story of the rich man, rich ruler there that uh, thought he could just build bigger barns, and the Lord said, your soul's going to be required of thee. And then number two, quickly, if your affections are set on earthly possessions instead of heavenly possessions. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 1, uh, Colossians 3, 2, set your affections on things above and not on the things of the earth. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That's Matthew 6, 33. Number three, quickly, when you think that your own spirituality, another man's spirituality, or the blessings of God can be measured by material possessions. Wow, that guy must be really spiritual. Look at the car he's driving. Or look at the suit he, or the dress she has on, or whatever it might be, or look at kind of, you know, I don't know how people judge money. I've never been a, a judger of people's money when it comes to spirituality. But people think, well, man, they're really being blessed. Look at them. But it's not a measure. The, the lady, the woman, at the, the woman with the two mites, she was more blessed by God with two mites than the Pharisees were spending, sending in, giving a lot more money than she was, but she gave out, out of her out of her abundance, everything. The Pharisees only maybe did a tithe, which is very important. But anyway, um, it's, we're not measured by our material possessions. Number four, when your object in life becomes to earn as much money as you can. Oh, you just got to earn as much money. Oh, if I get Now, if you go to Ecclesiastes, don't turn there, but it's Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 16. One of the wise, well, the wisest man, Solomon ever lived, uh, that ever lived in this world. He wrote Ecclesiastes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He gives a very bleak picture of man and his wealth. Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 16. And then when you think you provide for your own needs instead of God providing for them. If you think you provide instead of God providing Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. And so God will provide your need. Uh, again, he provides the strength and the abilities to do so. And so that puts us now where we're at this week. We'll finish out the lesson, Lord willing. Thank you for getting on the lesson this morning. And, and question number five in our worksheet says, What is the most important attitude you should develop toward material possessions. What is the most important attitude you should develop? Well, we find this, um, the first and, more, for, first and foremost, Paul said, be content. Be content with what you have. Understanding to be content is, 
is not to grudgingly resign yourself to accept the state or that, what I guess what I'm trying to say, but just rest satisfied in God's provision. You don't grudgingly, well, I guess I am what I am, I got what I have, and I don't have what I need, and blah, blah, blah. But you rest gratified and content on God's provision, realizing whatever you have has been given to you as a blessing. Your car, your home, your clothes, your food, whatever it might be. And so um, be content. Um, go with me to Hebrews. Well, we're here in, 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 in 1 Timothy. Be content with your wages is another thought here. The Apostle Paul teaches us through the attitude displayed in these verses. In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 8, having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men to destruction in destruction and perdition. In the verse number 10, we read it earlier, the love of money is the root of all evil. So we're, de we're to be content with whatever state we're in. Um, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse number five, is another reference here, Hebrews 13, five. It says this, let your, co let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Be content with whatever, whatever state you are in. Michigan, Ohio. Nobody wants to go to Ohio. Uh, not really. That's not the state I'm talking about. State of mind. State of uh, possessions. The state of your being. The state of your home. Whatever your state is. Uh, be content as Paul was saying here, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And then um, we're also uh, in Hebrews chapter 5, I'm sorry, Hebrews 13, 5, uh, we're, we can, we're, we're to be content with our possessions. Content with our possessions. And then one other reference in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 11. Um, here is Paul in Philippians 4. Does anybody know where Paul was when he wrote Philippians 4.11? He said, I, he said, not that I speak for want, respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So what was Paul's attitude to be content? Where was he at? He is, was in the prison in Rome. He wrote that while he was in prison and he was content and the state of incarceration and, um, and God gave him peace where he was at. And uh, he said, well, good. He had, a, he had a place to sleep and had meals. What, what more did he want? He wanted his freedom, I'm sure. I know a lot of guys commit crimes in the, in the beginning of winter. So they, have th they call it three hots and a cot. Three hot meals and a cot to sleep on at night instead of the cardboard box downtown under the bridge. So, so much for that. All right, number seven in our little worksheet. We're supposed to list six important things that money cannot buy and only God can give you. And we're going to go over these. And so the first one is in Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16 these are things that you cannot buy. You know, oh, I can buy anything. I got money. Well, you can't buy this. If you think that, you need this verse. Proverbs 16, verse number 16. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver? So the first thing that we cannot buy is wisdom. Wisdom is your answer right there. It's much better to have wisdom than gold. Gold can buy a lot of things, but it can't buy wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. Wisdom comes from the, 
the word of God. Uh, having wisdom uh, is the beginning of understanding. Uh, and then you cannot buy, in verse number 8 of chapter 16 of Proverbs, better is little with righteousness than great revenues without right. You cannot buy a righteous life. You can't. It, it takes character. It takes godliness. It takes holiness. It takes being separate from this world. It takes pleasing to God. What does that say? I quoted it earlier, Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So you can't buy righteousness. It comes from God. He imputes that to you as you live right and have a pleasing life in, in front of him. And then, um, since we're in Proverbs, I'm going to skip down to one here, then I'll go back up. We need to go to Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 16. What else cannot you buy? Proverbs 15, 16. Better is, a, is little with the fear of the Lord Better is little than the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. You know what you can't buy? You can't buy quietness in peace. You cannot buy quietness and peace. It, that peace comes from God. Uh, you say, well, I wish I could have a little peace and quiet. I'll just Maybe you can pay the children to go out and play. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about inner peace, inner quiet of your, of your soul. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes. There's one other verse that goes along with this. Again, Ecclesiastes would be the book right after Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and in verse number 6. Better is a handful with quietness then both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. So better, better is the handful with quietness. You cannot buy quietness. Money cannot buy that. It's just, it just comes from God. It comes from being at peace. And then in chapter 5, in verse number 12, we find another one that we cannot buy. And boy, some people like to buy this. The sleep of the laboring man is sweet. Whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. You cannot buy sleep. You say, well, if I could just go off and hide somewhere in a cabin to sleep for 20 days, it'd be wonderful. Well, you could probably rent a cabin and, you know, do something like that. But really, great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. When you have the peace of God... You have a good night's sleep. I can lay my head on the pillow. My wife tells me, says, Jim, within five seconds, you're out. <laughs> and uh, it happens very quickly. Sometimes it don't. Sometimes it depends on how wound up my mind is and so forth. But you cannot buy a good night's sleep. Labor, the, the sleep of the labor in man is sweet. I guess that's why I'm tired. I just work hard all day. Whether you eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich shall not suffer him to sleep. You can have all the money in the world, but it don't give rest and peace and sleep. And then, so we are here, and we're right near the book of Psalms 119. What's another thing you cannot purchase? Psalms 119, verse number 14, you cannot buy God's word. Well, I bought a Bible back in the print shop. Well, I understand that. You could purchase that, but this is... This is what the scriptures tell us about God's word. Psalms 119, verse 14. I have, I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. He rejoices in the way of testimonies. Look at verse number 72. The law of thy mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. Give me, better than thousands and thousands of dollars and money. The law of thy mouth, talking about God's word from his mouth, is better than money. And then in 127, it says this, Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold and, yea, above fine gold. And so God's word cannot be.
be bought. You can't buy God's word. I realize you purchase scripture, but it's given. It's free. Thy word have I hid in my heart. It's, it's a free book, and uh, you can get it. Thank God for that. And then Luke chapter 8. And people are looking for this one all the time, and they'll spend all kinds of money uh, on, on good health. Good health. You cannot buy good health. You say, well, I take a lot of herbs, and I do a lot of this, and exercise, and so forth. That's good. But, but you know, sickness comes upon uh, many people, and it does take money to get well. You've got to see doctors. You've got to buy medicine. You've got to buy herbs, and you've got to buy the, whatever you need. But Luke chapter 8, verse 43 says, A woman having an issue of blood 12 years has spent all her living on physicians, neither could be healed of any. So I realize you could spend money to get well, but really the great physician is who we turn to when it comes to the scriptures, when it comes to good help and what we need for uh, to make our lives at peace with our health. So um, if, if and when God blesses you materially, let me give you this thought, another thought completely. Don't forget God. Don't forget him. Uh, over here in Proverbs chapter 30, a lot of times people, we read that earlier, riches bring poor and cause people to err from the faith. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 7 to 9. Two things I have required of thee, deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee. And say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and still and take the name of my God in vain. You know, a lot of times people, you know, they get wealthy. They kind of say, well, I've got it now. I don't need God. And that's so sad. So many people miss out on the blessings of God. And they, they, when God could have blessed them even further, who, who knows how far they could have gone. And then many of them end up in poverty. And because God takes his hand of blessings off of their lives. And that's very sad. So realize, and go, go with me here now to Job chapter 1. And just I mentioned Job earlier, but I want to mention this again. If God takes all your wealth away, it should not affect our relationship with him. It should not affect our relationship with him at all. Here's Job. He just lost it all. Job 1, verse number 20. Then Job arose, ran his mantle, shaved his head, fell down uh, upon the earth, on um, the ground, fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. And so it didn't affect his relationship with God. He had The first instinct of him was, Hey, God's blessed me with it. God's taken away. Blessed be his name. And so we cannot, uh, we cannot let wealth we can't let possessions take our affect our relationship with God and we ought not to also be envious of somebody else's wealth in Psalms 49 these are not questions in our list but these are just some extra notes about being content in Psalms 49 verse 16 and 17 and be not thou afraid when one is made rich when the glory of his house is increased, and when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Don't be envious of somebody's wealth. They're going to leave it behind. The kids are going to fight over it. Amen? <laughs> I hope not. I think you ought to have a, a good will and a good way to take care of your, your needs, your, your family's needs after you're gone. Uh, but it's what it says here. Don't be afraid. Uh, there's no power in the grave. He said, my God, but God shall redeem my soul from the grave, for he shall receive me, Selah. And then in verse number 16, be not afraid of one that's made rich, um, for when he dieth, he shall. I've never seen a, a Brinks truck or an armored purser, pursued uh, 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 
money truck. You've seen them, Guardian, they're different names for different groups. Um, I've never seen one follow them to the grave and just dump all the money into the casket with them. Never seen that at all. Never seen it at all. And so uh, don't be envious of somebody else's wealth. And stay, uh, stay away from, another thought here, stay away from good, get rich quick schemes. Proverbs 20, verse 21, get rich quick. You have those schemes. They come up all the time, the pyramids and all that kind of stuff. Proverbs 20, verse number 21 says this, an inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. And there's nothing wrong with the inheritance. You get 200000 20000 $1,000 inheritance. Don't let that ruin you. You just stay even. I always appreciated when somebody got an inheritance that it never changed their lifestyle. You would act, they acted like they never even got it. They just lived and they put it away and invested it into their own family or paid off their house or whatever it might be. But um, don't let, it, it, that is not a get, get rich scheme. That is, inheritances are provided for from family to family. We understand that. Proverbs 28, verse number 20 says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. You've seen all these get rich things, win the lottery, whatever it might be, or go gamble it off. Verse 22 says, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye and considereth not the poverty, the poverty that shall come upon him. And so uh, I told you the story about the guy who, I don't know if he inherited $38,000 lived up north, and I didn't know the man, but the man in the church called me and says, hey, would you go by and visit my friend? He's, he's very depressed. And I said, what happened? He says, well, he had $38,000. He wanted to pay off his house. He wanted to go double his money, so he went to the casino to double his money, and he lost every penny of it. Huh. That's pretty stupid, to be honest with you. So I did go see the guy, and I led him to Christ. But uh, he was very despondent. But the, what he got that day was more richer than blessed in money, that's for sure. And then number eight on our, uh, on our little list here, and I need to hurry up. I just got a few more minutes because I know you're getting ready for church. If you're coming in or if you're going to watch online, we'll be on at 11 o'clock. Uh, it says, list five other attitudes you should develop towards money and material possessions. List these things. And uh, I'll just list them to you. I don't have references for these. I just, it's just common sense. Uh, be honest. Be honest with how you get your money. Be honest in every way and with your boss. Give him eight hours a day. If he asks for eight hours, be honest. Uh, number two, can I ask God to bless it? You're going to go make a deal. Is it a shady deal? Is it a crooked deal? Is it a subway God, can you bless this, this crooked deal I'm going to do? No, no, no. That's an attitude you should, you should ask yourself. Can God bless this transaction? Number three, is my gain at someone else's expense? Is my gain at someone else's expense? In other words, if I take advantage of this, it's going to hurt that brother or that person or that business, but I may made sure I'm going to make out pretty good on the deal. But if somebody's going to lose at somebody else's expense, then um, I have, my son came to me one time. He was going through some real financial problems. He had a business um, before he got full-time in the ministry to just make men, ends meet. And, and he went through some deep setbacks, thousands of dollars in setbacks, where he owed people money. And he said, I think I'm going to file bankruptcy. I says, you can file bankruptcy, but you still owe the people the money. You still got to pay it back. If you owe a man $100, you give, you, you give him $100. You owe him 1000 or 3000 whatever it might be. And so, if, well, if I gain bankruptcy, I don't have to pay him back. Well, that's what the law says, and that's what, but that's not moral obligation. Moral obligation, you buy something, you pay for it. Guess what? He didn't claim bankruptcy. His credit is building, and he's got it about paid off. By the end of the year, he'll be debt-free, and I'm proud of him. 
Um, could it be habit forming? The attitude you have, could it be habit forming? I know a lot of people go to the, have, and I don't know a lot of people, but I know people uh, across Michigan go to the casinos. And, but gambling could become a habit to where it, uh, you could lose big money. I've never lost a dime. I've never played. Uh, but it could be habit for me. Uh, I, 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 you say, why don't you gamble, Brother Green? I, I don't need to gamble. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. If he wants to give me gain, it don't need to come from the state of Michigan. It needs to come from God. And then uh, lastly here, would it hurt my testimony? What I'm going to do, if it's a shady deal, if it's a cheaty deal, or a dishonest deal, uh, would it hurt your testimony? You know, I've gone to buy vehicles and different things for different people, and I'm a wheeler dealer, and I like to deal and jew down and so forth. But there's some times that I have paid regular price for that item just so I can get a witness to them. The witness to me was more valuable to me than saving $20 or $100 on a deal. To be able to give them a track and clear conscience that I didn't try to take advantage of them. And there's some times when you can wheel and deal, you know the situation, they're set up for that kind of stuff and it's built into their price and so forth. You know, you got you to look it over and understand it. You understand what I'm talking about. But... And I realize in our culture, through the media and through advertising, it, there's a, it has a, a tremendous negative materialistic influence upon us. Got to buy, got to buy, got to buy. It's with commercials. But you need to guard yourself and be sure that your major desires and decisions are spiritual instead of material. Uh, and so have a balance. The Proverbs 11 one says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. So the same Bible that says not to worry about your material vision uh, provisions there in Matthew chapter 6 also says that if a man doesn't provide for his family, he's worse than an infidel. That's 1 Timothy 5.8. So you got to work by the sweat of your brow. you got to take care of it. And and take care of the, the needs of your family. And then number nine, lastly, it says here, um, God promises to provide. And so in our little blank, in our little worksheet, if you're working the worksheet, and you can get these worksheets later on, and maybe if you're in the class, you can go back and watch this online, um, and then you can you can fill in the blanks. But God promises to provide your needs, not your necessary wants. You understand that? In, in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 25. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 25. I know it's in my Bible. It was here just a, just a moment ago. Oh, there's Matthew. Not really. Matthew 25. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, whether what you eat or drink, or your body, what you could have put on, is not life more than meat and body than raiment. Behold, the fowls of the air they sow not, neither do they reap, gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Then it says, Are ye not much better than they? And of course she talks about the lilies and how God clothes them in the fields, how they grow and and so forth, and then but verse 33 is the key. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God will take care of you in the good day, in the evil day. To, you know what I wrote in a little, little in my Bible? where it says, and all these things shall be added unto you, period, I wrote today. Give us this day our daily bread. God promises to provide your needs, not your wants. Sometimes we want something and God blesses us with it, and that's, and that's a blessing. But he's, he promises to provide our needs, both needs, your needs, both material as well as spiritual. 
God wants to take care of you. Your spiritual needs and your material needs. And so that's our lesson today. So we have to discern between the needs and our wants. And sometimes that's difficult because we think we really, really, really want that. We really, really, really need that. But God knows what we need. For instance, you know, say you're praying for a new car. Oh, Lord, I surely need that brand new uh, Cadillac. Well, God knows that you might just need a Ford or a Chevy. Whatever it might be. God will give you what you need and uh, he'll take care of you along life's way. Isn't it a blessing to know the Lord and that he will take care of us and that we have nothing to worry about? Because as long as we're one of his children, like as as the scripture says, your father on earth gives you good gifts. How much more your heavenly father wants to give you good gifts? I have a wonderful father and I could go to him and ask him for anything and he'd He'd want to give it to me if he could. And he has many times been a blessing growing up, and living at home and so forth. And even since then. But oh, our Heavenly Father knows what we need and he just gives us exactly the time right when we need it the best. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the lesson today. Bless it and use it for your glory now in these people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen.